This is Mark Castellano currently being interrogated at the Houston Police Department regarding the missing case of Michelle Warner, his ex-girlfriend. Michelle and Mark first crossed paths while working for the same medical firm in 2008. Michelle, who was already a single mother, welcomed her second child with Mark a year after they initially met. However, just a few months after the birth of their child, Caden, Mark terminated the relationship when Michelle secured a permanent position at a law firm in 2012. Faced with this change, Michelle proposed an arrangement to Mark. The arrangement involved Michelle and Caden moving in with him and Mark helping to raise his son. They would cohabit, but not as a couple, just as Caden's parents. Mark agreed to this plan. However, on the 24th of September, Michelle failed to show up at work, prompting her employer to reach out multiple times with no response. That same day, Michelle's ex-husband contacted her brother, Dave Chiffon, expressing concern as Michelle had not picked up their daughter. David tried calling Michelle, but with no answer, he reached out to Mark. Mark informed David that on the night of Saturday, September 22nd, he had an argument with Michelle, resulting in her leaving. What troubled Mark even more was that Michelle didn't take her car and, most worryingly, left their child Caden behind. Mark admitted to David that he had no knowledge of Michelle's whereabouts. After Michelle was officially reported missing, authorities conducted a welfare check on Tuesday, September 25th, finding her absent from the apartment. I'm not wanting you to explain to me that you wanted to hurt Michelle. I want you to explain to me what you felt like you had to do to protect Kate. So I want you to be honest with me and tell me what happened. At the beginning of the interrogation, the detective ensured Mark felt comfortable removing any perceived threat. The detective then shifted strategies, directly implicating Mark in causing harm to Michelle, but framing it as an act to protect his son. This method aimed to make it more palatable for Mark to admit to the crime, as he might believe he was acting in the best interest of his son, rather than from malicious or selfish intentions. Subsequently, Mark confesses to the murder of Michelle. She got up, and um, I got up, and um, she's getting dressed, and she's finishing up, and she's still yelling, and Caden's hiding. I grabbed her, and I broke her neck. She told me I was a sorry and that I would, she was going to control me the rest of my life. And I grabbed her by her neck and she and, and just went through on the bed. And, so she's facing you? Yeah, and I heard it pop and then she just, her tongue up, it popped out and that was it. Okay. I mean, I sit there and held it and the time I realized what I did, she was dead. So do look at me, Mark. Look at me. I'm sorry. Um. Give me the death penalty, that's fine. Look, look, I deserve Mark, it. Mark. Look, I'm proud of you. My life is I'm, over with anyway. Your, your life's not over with, Mark. Mark. Kind of show me in the room where she was. Mike, here's the bed. Here's a closet. And here's that door going to outside. Okay. I walked in, and that's when I grabbed her, and then. I threw her on the bed right there. I know this is painful, but I wanted you to demonstrate for Brian what happened. I push her and then grab her and then kind of fall right, down you, on the floor. I know you're not going to do it because I got my brother Phil here to help me out. All right. And then I like, you know, sit there. And, and then I, what did she do? Well, when she fell down, I heard that. And then her tongue stuck out. And I just... Surveillance footage from the apartment complex revealed Mark's activities in the early hours of Monday morning, September 24th. At 3.21 a.m., he was captured dragging a large container to Michelle's car. Making several trips back and forth, he continued his actions at 5.41 a.m. and eventually left at 6 a.m. Subsequently, police conducted a search near Mark's parents' residence and discovered various items in a dumpster, including a Pampers box, Mark's business cards, sunglasses, Michelle's credit card, which had been cut up, clothing, and a bundle of black tape. During Mark's sentencing phase, his attorney contended that his case fell under the category of sudden passion. 
in Texas, sudden passion can be presented as a mitigating factor during the punishment phase of a trial, although it cannot serve as a defense to murder. The jury had the responsibility of determining whether Mark was driven to a degree of fear, rage, or resentment that a reasonable person in a similar situation with an ordinary temper would find challenging to control. If successful, this argument would have reduced the maximum punishment for murder from life imprisonment to 20 years, with the possibility of a sentence as short as two years. However, the jury did not agree that Mark's case involved sudden passion. As a result, he was sentenced to 27 years, becoming eligible for parole in 2026. Yeah, okay. Okay. three or four, four or five guys at one time. How that make you feel? Marlon Purifoy, a 43-year-old, committed the act of killing his girlfriend, a professional OnlyFans star. She had been discovered cheating on Purifoy multiple times, which, according to him, ultimately triggered him to take her life in a fit of rage. Here he is, seen trying to explain to the police officer why he felt it was necessary to take the drastic actions he took. Either way, she was showing you pictures of her having sex with other guys. Yeah, okay. Okay. three or four, four or five guys at one time. How'd that make you feel? First thing is, you have already made a step to come and give your side of the story. That's what we want. Because, okay. like I was telling you at the jail, there's always two sides to every story. We want to we wanna know yours, because it's not fair. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, I want you to <clears throat> feel comfortable with talking and just giving your, being completely honest. Because that's going to help you in the long mm. run over anything. You've already been through this. So you you know. Yeah, you read Sula, trust me. Hood vines. Yeah, you can see hood vines. Mm -hmm. turn off what happens after that? Well, that's not okay. She's showing me the videos that she missed with these dudes. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like six, seven dudes at one time. Some of the other videos that she. Gang bang almost. Yeah, gang. I'm saying that's what I'm trying to show y'all. You know what I'm saying? I snap. I man. believe you. I snap, man. I, I was choking her. I snap. I know what I'm saying? She had, she had the hammer wrapped right there. Where was the hammer wrapped? It's right by her left. And I snap, man. Was it on the dresser? It was on the dresser, yeah. So you choked her? Yeah. Marlon's decision to show the police the video indicates a desire to justify his actions. His behavior suggests that he's seeking validation for his anger, even if he recognizes that his actions were wrong. I think I was trying to do, do right, man. So I see did that, man. I know you got out. You started working. Yes. To provide for her. She just threw that right in my face, man. But you know, Marlon, on the flip side of it, she's probably so high, not even thinking straight, you know? She been doing that stuff behind my back. I ain't even know nothing about it. Even she was high. <laughs> I know. And I was hot. Have y'all ever been physically abusive to each other before? This no. Was the first time? I was looking out for it, take care of, cook food, everything. Just do everything for it. I didn't mean to do it like that for real, man. It was high click, man. Just looking at somebody like that, man. I know. That's, nobody would want to see that. See one of their loved ones I doing swear, that. I swear to God, man. I swear to God she showed me that, man, right in my face, man. I know. <laughs> she going to die, huh? If they decide to keep her on life support, she's from what I'm being told, she's not gonna have any functions. She's already suffered a couple of strokes on both sides of her brain, which would make her not have any functions and stuff. How many times I hit her? The doctor is saying almost thirty. Thirty times. Mm -hmm. I think you used the other side of the hammer, the claw part. Yeah. And did some pretty bad damage. There's a lot of blood. A lot of blood. I just feel bad because the kids went and saw it afterwards. They're, they're pretty shook up about it. It's hard to see their mama like that. Just unresponsive and trying to cast for air, basically. You know, I'm going to let you call your mama. What do you think they're going to do to me, to be honest? Well, right now we ha we've had to charge you with attempted murder. Mm. Um, if she does pass away, it's going to be murder. The police officer consistently references the victim's condition, emphasizing the severity of her injuries. This approach is intended to remind Marlon of the consequences of his actions potentially evoking feelings of guilt or remorse. Following this, the detective gives Marlon the opportunity to talk to his mother. To the murder, man. Man, y'all should have never got me, man. Please, why? <laughs> man, man, it's messed up, man. I'm like, life go, man. man. Yeah, you. Man, you did, man. You did. During his emotional phone call with his mother, Marlon's words reveal a growing awareness of the gravity of his actions. 
His repeated statements, such as, I swear I ain't meaning to do that, underscore a profound sense of remorse and shock. Marlon was pleaded guilty to attempted first-degree murder and will be required to serve 85% of his sentence. On February 21, 2019, a young girl between the ages of 6 and 8 came home crying after school. She told her parents and the police that a substitute teacher had touched her inappropriately while explaining an assignment. The authorities discovered that the substitute teacher was a 19-year-old man named Syed Yasin Asher. Asher started his substitute teaching career in December 2018 and taught 1,112 students at nine Osceola County schools. He preferred to teach first grade, but it was later discovered that he had a preference for elementary age children. In each of these schools, there were victims of his inappropriate behavior, and it was always the same pattern. The only reason Asher's inappropriate behavior did not continue for long was because of one brave girl who spoke to her parents about her experience on February 21st, 2019, which was also the last class Asher ever taught. The investigation began after her parents reported this incident, and on March 1st, Asher was interrogated about the incident. The detective starts off by trying to get through to him emotionally, but all Asher can manage is a shaky, I really didn't do it. It's hard to believe that an eight-year-old would make up such a serious accusation, especially when all the six to eight-year-old victims are pointing straight at Asher. The evidence seems to leave him no choice but to confess. You're not a little kid. You're you're an adult now. And you take responsibility for your actions. You decided to touch these girls. They didn't tell you to touch them. You made a decision. Honestly, you made a decision. You made a bad decision. You know that already. But if you really care about making it better, be honest. If you really care about making things right, be honest. I know you did. After emotionally pressuring him and repeatedly asking, the pivotal moment arrived when Asher finally admitted to committing this dreadful act. Tell me what happened. Inside her pants? Yeah. What is she saying? Something about it's cold or it was cold? Where did that happen? Outside or inside? Inside the house. Behind the desk or somewhere else? Inside the desk. What else do you do? Who did you do that to that day? Who did you do that to that day on the 21st? Only one person? Yeah. What was she wearing? The jeans. Mm hmm. Thief. Yeah. And what? Yeah, jeans. jeans. Uh huh. And what else? T shirt. So, how do you put your hands inside her pants? How did that happen? She was wearing a skirt. She's wearing what? A skirt. I thought you said jeans. I thought. What kind of skirt? Was it a jean skirt or was it something else? I think it's a yeah, jean skirt. Okay, so how did that happen? I was at the desk. Okay, but what happened? She came up to me, asked me a question. Okay. I told her to get your assignment and come here. Okay. No happened. Mm. I'll try to touch her. Mm -hmm. But how? how? Where do you put your hand? Asher apologized for his actions, acknowledging it was a terrible mistake. However, as the investigation unfolded, it revealed that this wasn't the only wrongdoing. Once the horrifying truth surfaced, Asher's life took a dreadful turn. Do you have anything else you want to add before I conclude the interview? Just feel sorry. I won't do it. 
Don't do what? Okay, I feel it's, it's a very wrong thing. It is, it is a wrong thing. You're attracted to little girls. Asher was charged with three counts of child molestation and was initially given a bond of $45,000. The judge ordered that he never set foot in Foggy Creek Elementary again and that he have no interaction with minors under 18. After Asher fulfilled his bond, more witnesses came forward and additional charges were added. The victims were between the ages of six and eight. Asher surrendered himself and was jailed in Osceola County without the option of bond. An investigation uncovered potential additional victims, but their privacy was maintained. The judge was confronted with the depths of Asher's darkness and had no choice but to charge him with 16 counts of lewd and lascivious conduct. Each charge carries a maximum penalty of 15 years in prison, but Asher was only sentenced to eight years. In July of 2021, he entered a plea agreement with the state, which required him to serve an eight-year sentence pay court costs of $2,676 and be designated as a sexual predator. Lastly, he will be deported after serving his time. Currently, he is facing about 17 charges and will be out of the country by 2029. Meet Christian Fernandez, a boy raised in a house of horror. Neglect by his parents and grandparents only made him repress his anger, which later made him the youngest person in history charged as an adult with first-degree murder. Christian was born in Miami, Florida in 1999 to Bianella Susana, who was only 12 years old at the time. His father, who was 25 years old, was given 10 years probation for sexually assaulting her. In October 2010, Fernandez and his mother were living with her new husband. A severe eye injury prompted his school to send him to the hospital for an examination of potential retinal damage. Fernandez informed officers that his stepfather had punched him. When the officers went to the family's apartment, they discovered the stepfather dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. On June 3, 2011, deputies were called to the apartment, where Hernandez's baby brother David was found dead inside. After the police discovered blood on his shirt, they decided to interrogate him about the events of that day. The detective begins by inquiring about the events of the previous night, but Christian starts making up stories. So tell me, tell me what really happened tonight. I put him to carry books. You put him to carry books? Mm-hmm. Okay, what kind of books? Like the books that we have on our bookshelves. Are they big books or little books? Or? Like a bunch of skinny books. Okay, so he was carrying them? Mm-hmm. Does he walk good with that one cast on? I did beat those with one and no one walks with the other. Okay, so he had books in his arms? Mm-hmm. And then what happened? And then they fell on him. They fell on him as he was carrying? As she was carrying them. Where they fell on him? Like? On, his, on his, like, on his head. And, uh, How did they fall on his head if he was carrying them? On, like, this he was carrying them. Because he didn't know how to carry away. So then what else happened? And then they fell on him and then he fell. This side of his head is really injured up with a lot of bruising and swelling. Mm -hmm. So, and his nose is really swollen up. Well, he didn't get those head injuries just from books. That's why we need to know the whole story, because that can't happen from just books. You know what I mean? Christian told the detective that his brother got injured from carrying books, but previously, he told the officers that his brother climbed up the ladder on the bunk bed and fell. Such inconsistencies only deepen the suspicion of his guilt. Detective Silvag then shifts gears, offering an emotional perspective on the situation. After posing a mix of heavy and mild questions, the detective successfully extracts the truth and Christian confesses to his actions. Let's take a look. Okay, so tell me what happened tonight. I pushed on my guns, I broke so. Okay, where's the bookshelf at? In front of my sister's bed. And how did you push him in? Like, what was he doing for you to push him? Nothing. Why'd you push him? Were you angry about something? Yes. What were you angry about? No, my sister did it to me. Oh, your sister did to you? Is that what you said? Why were you angry about that tonight? Because I was thinking a lot. Is there a reason why? Yeah. No. Is this because he was there? Yes. How many times did you push him into the... Show. Twice. You pushed him pretty hard. Well, what do you think? Did you push him pretty hard? Mm -hmm. What'd you say to him? You say bad words to him? Yeah. What'd you say? I didn't say anything to him. 
So, um, what shelf did he did he hit it? What, how did, where did he hit it on the bookshelf? On the first one. Can you show me with the doll how you push him into shelf? By his hand. So, show me with the doll what you, how you. I push it. In. Oh, okay. So you pushed him with your hand mm -hmm. into the shelf. Well, did he cry or did he just? Yeah, he cried. Did he pass out and go to sleep? Did he do that right away? I ran away and then I hit him twice. Is that all that happened tonight? Mm hmm So how did all the blood get in around the room? Because when I was dragging him to his bed, I actually carried him. Okay, to what bed? To my brother's bed. The bottom bunk? Mm hmm Okay. So you carried him to the bottom bunk and where was he bleeding from? From his mouth. Okay. Anywhere, anywhere else? No, his mouth. His mouth was bleeding? After the interrogation concluded, the detectives had a solid confession from Christian. However, a judge dismissed it, citing his lack of understanding of his Miranda rights during police questioning. Nevertheless, Christian was convicted of first-degree murder as an adult, although a sexual assault charge against him was dropped. At the time, he was 13, so he was given a juvenile life sentence, which means staying in jail until he turns 19. Fast forward to July 2018, he was placed on probation, with strict orders from the judge to stay away from minors and refrain from contacting his surviving siblings unless they initiated contact first. On the morning of August 31st, 2010, just before 6 a.m., Blue Earth County law enforcement received a distressing 911 call. A woman urgently reported that her husband had been shot and she herself had been assaulted. Blue Earth County 911. Oh my God, please help us. Please help us. Somebody save me. What's going on? Somebody shot my husband. Somebody shot your husband? Yeah. Please send the ambulance. Okay, is the person still there that shot him? I don't know. He left. Is there anybody else in the house with you? My son is not Oh my God, my son is so How old is your son? He's just um, 16. 16 year old? Oh my god, I better make it. Where in the house are you right now? I'm in the basement right now. Okay, is your son in the basement with you too? Yeah, my son is in my basement too. Are you okay? I'm okay. He got me, but I don't know. Got you? I don't know. No, he's done it. Freak out. No, you can't. You can't. I knew it was just He left. A sheriff's deputy, familiar with the family, promptly responded to the call, discovering Jennifer and her son Brady in the basement, armed for protection. In the master bedroom, the lifeless body of James Nibby was found, having been shot in the back of the head. The crime scene appeared disturbed, with furniture out of place. Paramedics and additional officers arrived, securing the scene. Jennifer provided a harrowing account of the events. She explained that she was getting ready for work when she heard a loud bang and discovered her husband shot. According to her, an intruder armed with a weapon and a knife attacked her, placing a rope around her neck and dragging her. The family dog's barking prompted the intruder to flee, sparing Jennifer. She went on to share details about the rope and knife, mentioning their origin from the garage, and identified the weapon as a recent purchase intended for deer hunting. The investigation into this tragic incident began. I want this to go away. I know. And I know it's not going to. I hope you can look at me in the eyes and believe that I'm not going to lie to you, okay? Um, we don't we don't want to do that. We don't need to do that. You said yourself, you've always been an honest person. You are of good character, okay? You have no criminal record. You have worked hard to make something of yourself, and you've worked very hard to make something of Brady, and he is a great kid. kid. He's number one in his class. He is a good kid. Oh, you God, know? he's a good kid. I just can't live with this lie. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna push you. I know you're having a very hard time with this, okay? This is completely understandable. But we do need to go through the details. Just one time, okay? Okay. And, and you do it, and we're not gonna push, and you do it at your own pace, okay? But I know you want to have the truth out there. Exactly the truth. Okay? From, from start to finish, one time. Oh, this is horrible. I know. It's horrible, though, you guys. I know. There was a gun Jim had bought for me. That's true, too. That's very true. Okay. Jim bought the gun for me, wanted me to learn how to target practice. Mm hmm And he had set the gun in the corner. Where at? In which room? 
in the um, but next to the sliding glass door. Okay. He set that in the corner, and, and I knew the ammo was up there too. Okay. And he had showed you how to load the gun. Mm hmm I had taken some pills before I had gone to bed. Do you remember how many? Probably like six or eight. Which sometimes when I do that, that I, I have a hard time sleeping to begin with because that is how it messes with you sometimes. It's kind of like make you agitated. And it does. It kind of keeps you up, um, makes you dream, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I woke up at 5.30 in a panic. <laughs> and that's when I went out and I cut the gun. And I loaded one shell. And I came back into the bedroom and there was a throw blanket thing on the end of the bed. So I took that. And kind of rest the gun on his shoulder. And I pulled the trigger. It's okay. Oh my god, I'm just so sick of this. This is not me. I am not this person. Called me one and I went back in this. I couldn't feel a pulse. Three days after Jim's murder, new information surfaces as Jim's boss, Darren, shares details of a conversation he had with Jim about a month before his death. Jim had mentioned that he and Jen were obtaining a $250,000 life insurance policy, an idea initiated by Jen, but one that Jim also thought was reasonable. Armed with this information, detectives decide it's time to bring Jen in for questioning and potentially make an arrest. On September 10th, 2010, two days after Jim's funeral, Jennifer Lee Nibby is taken into custody. The following day, after her arrest, Jen expresses her desire to talk, indicating a potential turning point in the investigation. On June 30th, 2011, Jennifer Nibby was indicted for first-degree murder. During the trial, she asserted that she had no memory of the events on the day of her husband's death. On July 9th, 2012, Jennifer Nibby accepted a plea deal and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. On the 18th of December, 2017, officers from the Cleveland Police Department arrived at the doorstep of 47-year-old Larissa Rodriguez. They were responding to a tip provided by Lissa's boyfriend's brother. Lissa is a mother of 10, but her five-year-old disabled son, Jordan, is out point of focus here. The tip suggested that something significant and profoundly troubling had occurred to him, something really really bad. When questioned about Jordan's well-being and whereabouts, Larissa stated that her five-year-old son was in Texas, visiting family. She claimed not to have contact numbers for the people he was staying with, and she was uncertain about his exact location. Given the tip concerning Jordan's welfare, these shaky details raised suspicion, prompting the authorities to obtain a search warrant to thoroughly investigate the house. At the time, Christopher Rodriguez, Larissa's boyfriend, was incarcerated. However, during a call to his brother, who was serving in the military in Pakistan, Chris confessed that Jordan was buried in their backyard. When the search warrant was executed, officers discovered the grim truth as they unearthed the child's body. Larissa was subsequently brought in for interrogation, hoping to extract the much needed answers. The problems being, Jordan had an old left wrist fracture. His left wrist was broken at some point and it was healed. It healed on its own. How? That's something you need to tell us. Jordan also has three fractured left ribs that healed on their own and a fractured right rib that healed on its own. And these are all injuries that were healing on their own without medical help, which means he was in a lot of pain for a very long time. Attempting to deflect blame, Larissa portrayed Chris Rodriguez as the prime suspect, citing his abusive behavior and her alleged tendency not to retaliate. Larissa claimed she was coerced into silence by her abusive partner, Chris. But in my heart, something told me that he had something to do with this. Because every time after this happened, I just hated him. 
I hated everything. I hated it. I just couldn't stand to be around him. Did you ever ask him to leave? I did. And he told me that if I was to call the cops, that he had the gas in his name, that they would tell me that he resides there, that he can't leave. So I just felt like I was trapped. And I even told him, this is my house. You have to go. But then he always threw up. Well, if he leaves, he's calling the cops and he's blaming everything on me. Which I didn't hurt Jordan. I did. I take the fault for not taking him to the doctor. Yes, that was my fault. And my other, my other fault was doing tissues, Ray. Bring was, tissues, Ray. was given the idea to do that. But I didn't hurt Jordan. I know. It's not in my heart to hurt Jordan. I know that. Do you know Jordan looked just like you? <laughs> Larissa claimed that Jordan wasn't eating and was losing weight. When raising a disabled child, it is common for parents to seek medical help, research symptoms, and deepen their understanding of the disability to provide appropriate care. However, none of the signs Jordan exhibited prompted Larissa to consult a doctor or have resources on standby to help comprehend his condition. This concerning neglect extends beyond Jordan to the other children in the household. According to social workers, her residence was described as having deplorable and unsanitary conditions, infested with rats and cockroaches. Shockingly, one child was even found eating a sandwich filled with cockroaches when authorities arrived. This revelation raises significant questions about Larissa's role as a caretaker and her level of care for her children. Well, and what I suggested to you yesterday is that the only way you heal yourself from all of this is to take responsibility for your side of the street. Meaning, if I drank, if I doped, if I didn't keep house, if I didn't put sheets on your bed, if I didn't feed you, if I was overwhelmed, if I didn't do my part to take care of you, then I own that. And Larissa then confessed that it was also her fault for not calling an ambulance when needed. No, just like I take the responsibility. I didn't take him to the doctor. That was my fault. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't call the ambulance when he needed it. That was my fault. Mm -hmm. Both Chris and Larissa were pleaded guilty to charges of involuntary manslaughter, felonious assault, child endangering, and gross abuse of a corpse in connection to Jordan's death. This admission came as part of a plea deal, enabling the couple to avoid a trial for murder, which carries a potential life sentence. Consequently, Lissa received a 25-year sentence, while Christopher was sentenced to 28 years. In Florida, Evelyn Laverne, divorced from her Navy SEAL husband Larry Wallace, found herself raising two children alone, 11-year-old Kelly Carpenter and 19-year-old Charles Trulock. In the late 70s, she encountered Merle Mackey at a prison outreach ministry for nonviolent offenders held at her local church. Their frequent interactions led to the rapid development of a strong relationship. Evelyn's teenage daughter last saw her on the morning of November 5, 1981. She prepared breakfast for her daughter, and Evelyn's new husband, Merle Mackey, took her to school. In the afternoon, Merle picked up Evelyn's daughter alone and informed her and her brother that Evelyn had gone to Ohio to care for her sick sister-in-law. However, she never arrived in Ohio, and her sister-in-law was not expecting a visit from her. Shortly after Evelyn's last sighting, Kelly became increasingly concerned about her mother's absence, repeatedly inquiring with her stepfather about her location and expected return. Merle provided inconsistent information to the police, initially claiming Evelyn had traveled to Tampa, Florida, but later stating she had returned home and left with a boyfriend. These contradictory statements raised suspicions, as they did not align with Merle's previous accounts and seemed inconsistent with Evelyn's usual behavior. At the time, all detectives could ascertain was that Evelyn disappeared on November 5th with no trace of her anywhere. Her family officially reported her missing in January 1982. During the investigation, it was discovered that on the day she went missing, there were multiple withdrawals from her bank account. Over the following months, the account was entirely depleted. Unfortunately, the case went cold, and it wasn't until Sergeant Phil Lankin attended a national homicide conference 33 years later that renewed interest in Laverne's disappearance was sparked. Investigators located Merle in Chandler, Texas, and devised a plan. They informed him of a fictional plane crash in South America, 
suggesting they might have found Laverne's remains. To potentially qualify for compensation from the airline, they explained that he needed to revisit his statement about her disappearance. Willingly, Merle agreed, and upon returning to the station, investigators asked him to verify his previous interview transcripts. November 5th, 1981, okay? Unfortunately, I think that it's something you've been hiding all of this time. Merle's demeanor shifted, transitioning from a relaxed and confident state during the entire interview to becoming somewhat anxious and attentive as the detective delved into more challenging subjects. Tell me what to worry. Where are we at right now? Merle, I'm just waiting for a confession. I can care less about the confession because I don't need it. This deceptive statement by the detective, while untrue, serves a strategic purpose. It creates the illusion that Merle has been exposed even though the detectives can only press charges if he confesses. Such a flippin' low light. Give me the damn body. Because without the body, it looks like a first degree murder in every way, shape, form, fashion. It's the absolute truth. And then you have the cover up to it afterwards. Does it look like a first degree murder? Absolutely. Will it work out best for you to tell me where that body is? Absolutely. You'll work. You'll walk I out am here. not convinced that. Okay. You're walking out, out here. that front door. Okay. Three man today. I, well, I can get up and leave at any time. Can I, I get, get up right now and leave? Yes. Yeah. Sure. With Merle on the verge of leaving, the detective adopts a last-ditch strategy. He attempts to downplay the entire incident, suggesting to Merle that whatever happened was not entirely his fault and might have been an accident. The aim is to make it easier for Merle to confess to a lesser charge, even though it wouldn't lead to a conviction for first-degree murder. At this point, it becomes their only option to move the case forward. Did I tell you I like to go fishing? Yes, I did. Okay. I went fishing at English. Mm -hmm. She fell at the dock, hit her head, fell in the water. Mm -hmm. I have been back there a hundred times, raving about that deal, that I didn't jump in the water to save her. I've been living with this for 32 years. I was scared they think that I've killed her. After nearly 33 years, Merle Mackey has finally confessed that his wife was indeed dead, and he was present at the scene. However, the detectives remain skeptical and are not fully convinced by this version of the story. Why didn't you call for help and say, hey, she's in the water? Her head was bleeding pretty bad. She was not breathing. The body in the water, especially that one, it doesn't go away. Well, I put some weight on her to take, take her bottom down. And when I rope that rope around that woman and watched her sink, it's never gone away. It was an accident. You tell me the truth right now? Well, you, well, you. I'm telling you, there's a straight business. Merle, when you're picking her up, I just place. took her clothes. You're pulling out and you're picking her up out of water? Did you lift her back up on to the dock? No, because she was, I mean, blood was just sparkling out. Just sparkling. At this particular moment, Merle Mackey unknowingly admitted to committing first-degree murder. The use of the word spurting suggests that Evelyn was still bleeding and, therefore, alive when Merle decided to tie her up and throw her into the water. After that, detective brought the case to Florida's 8th Judicial Circuit Assistant Attorney Brian Kramer, and a grand jury indicted Merle for first-degree murder. Merle ultimately pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and received a 10-year prison sentence. Raymond Gates swiftly paved his path to prison during his interrogation after police obtained footage of him assaulting a 17-year-old girl. Proving lack of consent was challenging due to limited camera coverage, but Raymond's significant slip-up during questioning made the case crystal clear. Without much effort, law enforcement had all the evidence required to secure a conviction. This girl came back to my house, she's told me she wants to lose her virginity, man, that like she's ready to do it and everything. And then right a couple seconds before and she's like, uh, she's like, I don't know and stuff like that. She's telling me, yes, everything's cool, she's cool with making out. But when she, when she screamed, stop. Please don't do this. It hurts so much. I was already what, inside what? of her at that point. I mean, like the oh no stop. I'm already like inside of her there, man. That's already like that's when she's like, oh, it hurts. Which it hurts when a girl gets her virginity taken. Consequently, he was promptly found guilty and sentenced to nine years behind bars. Ricky discovered drenched in blood near the lifeless bodies of Lara Kuchar and Tommy Skeens presented an obvious suspect for law enforcement. The crime scene indicated an assault on Lara, with Ricky's DNA further linking him to the scene. However, 
To the surprise of the police, Ricky would inadvertently simplify the case for them. Despite the mounting evidence, Ricky insisted that he was not the actual murderer. He had only attacked the couple and assaulted Laura. He claimed that someone else had carried out the fatal act. Ironically, by speaking up, he might have compromised his chances of getting away with the crime. Hey. Hey. Come on in. Hey. Yes, sir. Yeah, I did. Oh, I did. You know what? Let's do this. I did it, but I think somebody came behind me and finished it. Okay. Yeah, I did it. As the evidence against him was already substantial. Despite Ricky's assertions, the evidence pointed to him being responsible for the fatal injuries inflicted on the couple. Three more people. I don't know. And you know what? They was living when I left. But I think somebody came in behind me and finished them off. I did beat the shit out of them, but it was somebody else. I don't I left. Consequently, he was ultimately found guilty of both first and second degree murder, along with charges of battery related to the assaults on Lara. In the audio clip, you just listened to the distressing screams of 13-year-old Megan, who witnessed a horrific event that no child should ever have to endure. Her sister, Sabrina, brutally stabbed their mother, Lisa Nofell, over 200 times. Despite the subsequent arrest, interrogation, and murder charges against Sabrina, one haunting question lingers. What drove her to commit such a heinous act? Let's talk about Sabrina Zunik. Sabrina faced a tough childhood in a home marked by her parents' struggles with addiction. Raised by her grandmother for years, at 14, she found herself at the Emma K. receiving home. The following years shuffled her through foster care, leaving her longing for a loving family. Then, in July 2011, a glimmer of hope emerged when Kevin and Lisa Cannell took her in. At first, Sabrina fit seamlessly into their family with daughters Megan and Haley. However, as time passed, tensions rose. Sabrina clashed with Lisa over perceived favoritism, even though Kevin supported her. Despite excelling in school and getting along with her new sisters, a void at home triggered Sabrina. The turning point came on a chilling November morning in 2012 when a distressing call to Willoughby Hills 911 came from 13-year-old Megan. As the police hurried to the scene, they discovered Sabrina Zunik holding a bloody 15-inch knife. In the master bedroom lay the lifeless body of Lisa. Instead of fleeing, Sabrina stayed, likely due to the shock of the attack. After being treated for her own stab wounds, she faced interrogation just 10 hours after the murder. Haley, Megan, and Kevin are all safe. They're they're at home at, right now. Haley's with Judy. All right. So Megan's with their dead, and Kevin's with Judy also. Detectives delivered the news of Lisa's death. Sabrina's reaction suggested she was pretending ignorance of the fatality, despite being well aware of her violent actions. As detectives unravel the events of the previous night, Sabrina remains tight-lipped, responding with a simple I don't know to every inquiry. Nevertheless, the mounting evidence leaves the detectives with ample grounds to charge her with first-degree aggravated murder. Anything coming back? No. Mm. Recall coming out of the bedroom with a knife in your hand? No. Well, it's, you, know, you had a knife and you stabbed police, so. I did. Yes, you did. And, and, and Megan called the police. And that can't be true. Brie, it is. I'm sorry. During Zunik's interrogation, Kevin returned home, appearing calm and oddly more curious than disturbed by the attack. Later, when he attempted to visit her in Lake County Jail, his irritation at being denied access raised eyebrows. By spring 2013, as Zunik languished in jail, Kevin swiftly handled his late wife's affairs, collecting insurance money, paying off debts, acquiring property, and even pursuing flying lessons. Kevin, do you know anything that was happening at the house the night before you left for work that night? Well, let's, let's, hang on a sec. We just talked about talking about his wife's work. What's going on at the house the night before is not his wife's work. Okay. Where did your wife work at? Kind of county children's family services. What did she do there? She was a social worker for the um, children's were you and uh, Lisa in the process of going through a divorce? Okay, now we're getting outside the... Uh... However, almost six months post-murder, a pivotal moment emerged. 
Zunik, in a breakthrough move, agreed to a proffer, a process where she would openly confess the intent of the murder to a prosecutor, committing to complete honesty. It was Kevin's idea, and it was talked about after we were having sexual relations, and him and Lisa were having problems in marriage. He wanted to get a divorce, but Haley, which is a three-year-old daughter of his and her, was in the picture, and he wanted full custody. She would get custody, or it would be shared, and he didn't want that happening. So the alternative was for this to happen. When was it after you started to live there on a daily basis that your relationship with Kevin changed? When did the sexual nature start to change? Um, it all started not with sex but with massages because he was a truck driver and his legs would cramp so it was in her thigh then it progressively got into sex does he ever tell you hey you can't tell anybody about this all the time did you say what would happen if you told then you'd be taken out of my care and i could lose my foster parent license what did you say in response to that i would never do that okay tell on him Unraveling a sinister plot, it was revealed that Kevin orchestrated the entire crime. He persuaded Sabrina that, post-murder, she'd serve a mere two to three years, with him ensuring regular visits. However, after six months of his absence, Sabrina decided to expose her monstrous foster father. It wasn't just her word against his. Over 1,500 messages, many of them disturbingly sexual, were uncovered. On June 11, 2014, Kevin Cannell faced justice found guilty on all 11 counts, six for sexual battery, three for complicity to commit aggravated murder, and two for conspiracy to commit aggravated murder. His sentence, life in prison with the possibility of parole. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. In 2013, Zunik was also given the same sentence, but the proffer granted her parole for 30 years. On July 20th, 2019, Delta Airlines Flight 1782 was ready for takeoff. The pilot, 37-year-old Gabriel Lyle Schroeder, approached Terminal 1, reserved for crew members, only to encounter an unexpected baggage screening. Oddly, despite being the pilot, this seemed to catch him off guard. The TSA agent who interacted with Schroeder noted his suspicious and tense demeanor. The pilot appeared somewhat disheveled, sporting the classic white uniform with epaulets. Rather than addressing the screening, Schroeder took an unusual route, ignoring nearby restrooms, he retraced his steps past duty-free shops and waiting lounges, eventually finding his way to a restroom devoid of surveillance. His actions raised eyebrows, strongly suggesting an attempt to conceal something significant. Meanwhile, officers were on high alert for Schroeder and attempted to locate him. Before they could track him down, Schroeder reappeared at the baggage screening checkpoint. Air Marshal Joseph Loftus, stationed there, questioned him about his sudden return. Schroeder claimed he had left his iPad in the Delta crew room. According to the Air Marshal, Schroeder seemed extremely nervous and deceptive, raising suspicions. The Air Marshal, along with some officers, retraced Schroeder's steps. After a basic search, they uncovered a sealed 1.75L bottle of vodka. With reasonable suspicion that the pilot might be intoxicated, Detective Dylan Thomas stepped on board to engage with him. Detecting alcohol on his breath and observing nervous behavior, the officers had no choice but to detain Schroeder, disembark the passengers, and cuff him. Subsequently, he faced interrogation from Detective Dylan Thomas. What, what time about did you have your last drink yesterday? Um, uh, 6 o'clock in the evening. Okay. And how many did you have? Um, well, that was like my last drink I had. I think I had, I had four. Four? Yeah. Oh, four. Yeah. And what were they? Uh, it was one, I had one beer and then uh, three uh, mixed drinks. Okay. And how big was the beer? Uh, just a can. Okay. Can of uh, like, And what were the mixed drinks? Uh, it was vodka. Okay. And where was that at? My house. Your house? Okay. Real town? Yeah. That's your address on the um, on your license? Uh yeah, okay. yeah. 1341. Yep. What's uh what's a good phone number for you? Five oh seven. So did you feel any of the effects still today? No. Okay. No, no, I'm I'm 
He's claiming he felt no effects of the drink as he boarded the flight, and that's a lie. However, his blood was drawn for a blood alcohol concentration, Basie test, revealing a concerning range between 0.4% and 0.08%. To put it into context, the legal limit for driving a car typically falls around 0.05 to 0.07%. Considering he was piloting a plane, the international standard mandates a base sea level, not exceeding 0.04%. Clearly, he was far from sober enough to operate the aircraft. Following the interrogation, the blood alcohol concentration results confirmed Schroeder's intoxication, exceeding permissible limits. As a consequence of his actions, he received a 30-day sentence of electric home monitoring and work release. There was also a jail sentence of 335 days, which could stay for two years, provided he followed the guidelines of his sentence, which included no alcohol or drug-related offenses. Subsequently, he was removed from flying. This is Aaron Ray Yabra, a young guy dealing with a tough upbringing in a world full of problems. His dad, Ambrose, had a history of getting into trouble, having been caught drunk driving five times. Aaron himself struggled with drinking and trying out drugs, while his little brother Joel got hooked on heroin. Although Aaron tried to stay away from alcohol for a bit, his dad's third DUI arrest messed things up, and he went back to drinking. He said it was his way of dealing with feeling down after his dad got locked up again. In the midst of all the chaos, Aaron's mom, Janice, worked tirelessly to keep their family together and maintain some order. She had a job and took charge of running their home whenever her husband was in jail. Both Aaron and his younger brother Joel shared an interest in weapons. Even before they were legally allowed to own them, their resourceful mom stepped in and registered the weapons in her name, as she mentioned in one of her police statements. His troubled upbringing and lack of proper support led him to vent his hatred towards the world to psychologists and therapists. When that didn't provide the relief he sought, he turned to expressing his anger in a personal journal. On June 5, 2014, he unleashed his rage on the campus of Seattle Pacific University. Aaron drove there and tragically took the life of 19-year-old freshman Paul Lee on a sidewalk outside Otto Miller Hall. He also injured another man, Thomas Fowler. Attempting to harm a female student, a misfire from his weapon allowed her to escape. He then entered Otto Miller Hall, where he shot 22-year-old Sarah Williams as she descended a staircase. Pointing the shotgun at another student, Another misfire allowed John Mize, a student safety monitor, to intervene and subdue him with pepper spray. Two students provided first aid to Williams, while another alerted those in classrooms. Security promptly apprehended him, and he was taken into custody by authorities. Subsequently, he underwent interrogation by detectives. In his interrogation, Aaron revealed that those who didn't take him seriously and laughed at him were the first to get shot and killed. Security took you in, the security sprayed you with pepper spray? Yeah. Okay, as you were reloading? Yeah, I could have got away with it if my, if I knew my barrel was, for one new, if I knew my barrel, my bottom wood barrel was, was a dud. Right. And, and also, if I knew I would have broken in more because it shot the, shell won't go in if the barrel is not, if you don't break it in, I'll break it, break it open all the way. And where's the shotgun now? Police have it. Okay. Did you see the police take it? No, but they put it in a room. I know they have it somewhere. Oh, okay. But it's there at the scene? Yeah. Okay. So it's the school security pepper sprayed you, and how soon after they sprayed you did the cops uh, show up? Oh, uh, they were pretty quick. Faster than I expected. Um, it was probably about maybe, it was minutes, probably about maybe four to six minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it felt like. I don't know the exact time. Uh, well, no, no disrespect, but the, how the way it felt, just, I don't know, feeling that hateful power, just when I heard the SWAT team was there, it just made me feel good. Mm -hmm. But that's but that was me feeling my hate. When did you hear the SWAT team was there? The officer said that the the SWAT team had, <coughs> SWAT team was there, and uh, and they had their keys or something. Oh, okay. Um, well, what if you ran into the SWAT team guys? Oh. Uh, well, if I had to, well, I've been wanting to die, so if they gave me no, if they <clears throat> gave me no choice, I have no choice but to shoot at them to get them to kill me. Mm -hmm. Main priority was to die, but I had to pay the price somehow. Right. It was just a requirement. My OCD just gets to me. Okay. It's like extreme or something. Then. Um, Sit tight for a second. Do you need anything else? Water or anything like that? Mm, no, I'm fine. In his last journal entry, he wrote, I just want people to die, and I'm going to die with them. 
I'm not asking for forgiveness because there won't be any, but it is what it is. I'm doing some people a favor by sending them to heaven. But those who are sinners like me, I'll see you in hell. In November 2017, Aaron Ibarra was found guilty by a jury on charges of first-degree murder, three counts of attempted murder, and one count of assault. He was sentenced to 112 years in prison. The judge dismissed his insanity plea, given the overwhelming evidence supporting the premeditated nature of the crime. On the 17th of February 2019, David Wright and his companion Christopher set out for what they thought was a routine drug deal on a street corner at 3.40 a.m. However, this transaction was no ordinary exchange. It was a carefully planned setup for a robbery by both parties involved. David, the instigator, demanded that the buyers surrender their possessions. In response, they retaliated by pepper spraying Christopher and making a run for it. In a swift turn of events, David swiftly drew a weapon from his waist and fired a single fatal shot into Raul Cuadro's chest, causing immediate death. Following the shooting, David and Chris fled the scene, burying the weapon in a nearby field, convinced they had committed the crime without leaving traces. Unfortunately for them, they were swiftly identified through multiple surveillance cameras in the vicinity. Despite their attempts to evade capture, David was apprehended two days later, remaining confident that his perceived exceptional intelligence would absolve him of guilt. Little did he know how wrong he was. I got several people who have already identified you. You're identified on video, so it's not a question of that you were there. It's more a question of what led up to this, because I don't think this is what was actually supposed to happen, right? So you're just going to play that, that you have no idea what happened because you weren't there. I uh, was not, no. Not only was David identified by multiple individuals through CCTV footage, but he also lacked a credible alibi. Additionally, incriminating Facebook messages were recovered, detailing the discussions related to the planned drug deal. The evidence placed David at the scene at the time of the murder. Have I been disrespectful to you? Have I been disrespectful to you? Have I insulted you or, or come at you hard or done anything other than You called me a liar. Yes, you did. You were lying. I'm not lying. Do you not freely admit that you lied to me in this interview? Where did I lie to you? About meeting up with Cody. About being home, not going out at all, and then now you periodically are going out. Would you not concede that both of those things were lies? I don't go farther than a couple blocks from my house. On foot, to meet somebody very quickly and come back. Okay. That's not so, what you told me. That's that you don't leave your house? Home. I don't leave my house. I was home all weekend with my girlfriend. It's on tape, man. There ain't no secret. I, Dude, I've got to walk my dog. Of course I leave the house, periodic. Okay. But as for did I go anywhere... So you were never at Casino in Evergreen, anywhere near there within three or four blocks, Saturday night. I just want, want to make sure that we have this down. Let's see. Something. How far is the Starbucks on Evergreen? Which Starbucks? The one on 75th. Yeah, no, Too I'm not talking about that. Okay, yeah, then no, I wasn't. Okay. So you're at the Starbucks on 75th? Earlier in the evening, yeah, like 8 or 9 o'clock, something like that. Well, that's not home. Did you lie to me? Can no. I, get a, I don't even get a smile out of that one. I didn't, I didn't get you on that one. I feel like I got you on that. Caught in an evident lie, David's discomfort becomes palpable. His self-centered ego takes a hit, putting him on the defensive. Okay, you can pretend you're getting upset about it, but you're really not. No, I'm what I'm getting upset about is you call me a liar. About. Because you lied. You lied. And I don't actually think I called you a liar. I did say you lied, but I don't think I actually called you a liar. So I'll call up to you now so we can just move past it. You are a liar. You have lied. Do you want to tell me what happened or not? Couldn't tell you because I don't know. Fair enough. We'll end up close the tape out for you right now. Should have done that a long time ago when I said the conversation was over. Oh, okay. Whatever you say, partner. As the interrogation progressed, David's refusal to speak became evident, abandoning the articulate demeanor he initially presented. This silence persisted, leading to a lack of defense or cooperation during the court proceedings. Given his extensive criminal history, including charges of arson, burglary, vehicle theft, and numerous misdemeanors spanning back to 1999, David faced the maximum sentence. In October 2020, at the age of 33, he was sentenced to 40 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Hello? My dog is attacking my family. Your dad is attacking your family? No, my dog. Oh. 
These were the horrifying words of 12-year-old Daniel James Bever as he pleaded with the police to rescue him from his two older brothers who were wreaking havoc inside his house, killing everyone in their path. In less than a minute into the phone call, Daniel's screams for help and pleas for his life filled the line until it abruptly went silent. The police swiftly responded to the distress call and were met with a gruesome scene that unfolded throughout the house. Blood was splattered on the porch, and a faint cry for help emanated from inside. The desperate plea coming from 13-year-old Crystal Bever. The surviving Bever children, a 13-year-old girl, saying her brothers were fascinated by mass killings for at least a year. Tragically, everyone else in the house, except for two-year-old Autumn, had lost their lives. Police detected commotion near the back door and encountered the assailants, Robert and Michael Bever, covered in blood and wearing smiles that seemed to reflect pride in their heinous acts. Robert, with a laugh, told the police that committing multiple murders had elevated him to godlike status. I was hoping maybe you could kind of just go back at the beginning when all this started and kind of tell me what happened. Uh, a couple months ago, we started talking about rampage and stuff like that. Okay. And I didn't take it seriously at first, but then he started buying like body armor and stuff. Where did he buy body armor from? eBay and Amazon. The series of murders commenced with Crystal's horrific discovery of her brothers gearing up with body armor and knives in their room around 11.30 p.m. on July 22, 2015. Michael lured her to his computer, providing an opportunity for Robert to slit her throat from behind. Uh, where did he start buying guns from? Um, he bought them online. I think the website's like Bud's Gun Shop and it's all He bought two blocks, he bought 41, and a shotgun of here. It's like a mock spoon thing. Okay. And then he bought 250 shotgun rounds okay. on eBay. And then I think he bought close to a thousand rounds for the clocks. Wow, okay. And where was he supposed to pick those? By the ammunition, it was being shipped to the house. Despite Crystal's attempt to escape, Michael quickly pursued and dragged her back inside. With the three eldest family members incapacitated and their parents dead, the brothers left their four younger siblings, assuming they would pose less resistance. Subsequently, Daniel was brutally stabbed 21 times in the back, shoulder, and chest. The final two victims, six-year-old Christopher and five-year-old Victoria, were hidden in locked rooms. Michael, however, managed to deceive them into thinking Robert was attacking him as well, luring them out and enabling the brothers to finish their heinous act by stabbing the young siblings to death. And so she fell down and started screaming. Yeah, well, I kept stabbing her. I kind of creeped out because, you know, and then my mom came in and she started yelling, called the police, get dad. And then he came over and started attacking her. So he stabbed your mom with the same knife? Yep, same knife. And where did he stab her? I think in the neck too. Michael admitted that the murders held no personal motive and were driven solely by a desire for recognition and fame. Despite their attempts, neither of the boys had much of a chance. Michael tried to plead not guilty on the grounds of insanity, but their legal defenses were unsuccessful. Both were sentenced to five life terms without the possibility of parole. The surviving children, Crystal and Autumn, were adopted by the same couple. Jared Murray takes the cake for the most insane interrogation in history. He shot his friend in the head during a car ride to Walmart, with no apparent motive other than wanting to experience what it felt like to kill someone. Following the crime, Jared tried to escape by hitchhiking to Canada, but was apprehended by an officer who accurately matched his description. In custody, a brief yet profoundly unsettling interrogation unfolded. Jared didn't waste any time, confessing even before reaching the station. Okay, and what do you remember telling me? Uh, in summation that I'm guilty, yes. Of what? Of murder. Okay, and who did you murder? Uh, Gennaro. Okay, and then how did you murder him? With a gun. I shot him in the head twice. Okay. Uh, three shots were fired, one missed. However, the intriguing aspect of this interrogation lies not just in the swiftness of his confession, but also in the underlying reasons and his overall demeanor throughout the interview. Jared demonstrates a complete absence of empathy, remorse, or recognition that his actions were morally wrong. He narrates his actions as if they were factual, and a subsequent psychological assessment revealed that this lack of understanding stemmed from his diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. His delusions led him to believe that he was compelled to commit the act. Jared, give me your full name. Jared Lindreth Wayne Murray. 
Okay. And what's your date of birth? Uh, July the 20th, 1994. And how'd you guys hook up? Uh, I went down to his dorm room and asked if I could be given a ride to Walmart in exchange for $20 gas money. Okay. And did he agree to that? Yes, sir. Okay. And that's a couple miles from the school? Uh, 1.7 miles, sir. 1.7 miles? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, now, so he took you to Walmart? Yes, sir. And did you both go in? No, we did not go in, sir. Okay, and why not? We pulled into the parking lot, then I pulled the uh, weapon on him and demanded that he take me to Asher, Oklahoma, sir. Okay, and why did all of a sudden did you decide that you needed to go to Asher? because I was planning to take him out into the country and kill him. Jared willingly provides additional details about the motives behind his disturbing actions. So you've been, you've been planning this for two days? Uh, two weeks, yes. Two weeks. But not with a selected individual, no. Okay. And when did you get to the point where you knew it was going to be him? That was three days prior to the incident. And why him? Uh, all the kids in college here, why, why him? I believed that he would have had the least impact, sir. Impact of on what? Uh, I believed he didn't have many friends, or many close friends, I should rephrase. And as his, <clears throat> as he is going missing, his absence would be less notable. Jared faced charges of first degree murder, but was ultimately deemed not guilty by reason of insanity. Rather than serving a prison sentence, he was committed to a mental health facility where he would receive the treatment that was essential for his condition. Devin Arthurs is accused of ending the lives of his roommates, Jeremy Himmelman and Andrew Onshuk, in their Tampa Palms apartment. He says he did it because they didn't respect his new religion after he stopped being a neo-Nazi and became Muslim. He and Brandon Russell used to be into extremist stuff together, but Himmelman and Onshuk were starting to move away from that. They stayed because the rent was free and there was good fishing nearby. Arthurs first said he did it because they made fun of his religion, but later he changed his story, saying he stopped them from causing a big disaster. He took their lives when Russell was away with the National Guard. After the incident, Arthurs took hostages in a smoke shop until the police caught him. He confessed to the murders when they arrested him. During his interview, Arthurs disclosed several troubling details. The honest truth. That's all right. I'll give you, I'll give you that. Okay. These people, um, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what happened today. Yeah, take it from the beginning, man. So I remember, I woke up. Yeah, what, what, tell me about that. What, what's that all about? Adam Waffen Division is, is a terrorist organization. It's a neo-Nazi organization that I was a part of before I converted. So what's it called? And Adam Waffen Division. Okay. And I remember, uh, and I remember my roommate, Brandon, he's alive, the guy that was in the American uniform. Huh? I hope he gets his shit together. I hope he gets his life together. He's a good person. But the things that they were planning were horrible. They are planning bombings and stuff like that on, count on countless people. They are planning to kill civilian life. Well, do they, were they specific in their plans? Um, power lines, nuclear reactors, uh, synagogues, things like that. And the reason why, like, I mention this is because, and it's self-evident, you go into the place, like, there's a giant Azov Regiment flag that's in the background. Azov Regiment is an organization in Ukraine, which is an NS movement that crucifies people and has harmed a lot of people that came directly from there. These people were not good people. Arthurs explains that since his conversion, he no longer sees the need to harm others out of hatred alone. Despite this, he seems convinced that the killings he carried out served a greater purpose. And um, I remember I really held on to these beliefs, and it, that really clicked to me, and I started reading into it, and I found the miracles of the Quran and the, the things that really got it, and that's what really like sparked my interest into it. That's what really got me. Did you have any guidance from anybody else that was maybe more uh, you know, familiar with the faith? Or Not did you have any, you were self taught Self-taught. Okay. Uh, I remember I, I would go to... Um, I would go to, like, this has nothing to do with what happened today, but just a little bit of context. Yeah, give some background. Yeah, that's what I'm after. I remember uh, I used to go to, like, the mosque on Sly Avenue, a really big mosque. I remember I used to go to Mosque in Open Backer. And those people are very kind and, and good-natured people. They don't have, wouldn't harm a fly. You know, they don't talk about any of the conflicts or anything like that going on over there. So they're, you know, they're fine. They don't have anything to do with, with this. Just some context on how I really came to have this and how, unfortunately, things have gone so out of proportion that has led to what we have right now, 
You know, I mean, all I can really do at this point. Well, I know you believe that, but I'm asking specifics. Did you do you know about any specific plans that these two individuals had? Yeah, they're planning on going down down south to Alligator Alley and destroying 500 KD lines that were going that were going along the the road there. How are they planning on doing that? They're planning on ba- on taking HMTD and placing it at the base of the of the thing and then blowing it up. Just these two individuals? Well, the Brandon. Brandon was going to be a part of that as well. Yeah, I remember. Did they expect you to be a part of that? Yeah, they did. I wasn't going to be part of that, though. Like, even with your current faith, they still expect you to go along with it? Yeah. They were just, I guess. I mean, that's what... I mean, I know for a fact that they wanted me to. I'm just saying, I guess, because they were idiotic to think that I would have went to go do that with them. And I remember um, with the nuclear materials, he was planning on building a mortar and firing it into a... Um, there was a nuclear plant off the coast of Florida, and uh, it's off the coast of Miami, and it's used to power that entire city in Fort Lauderdale and that kind of thing. And they're planning on firing that mortar of nuclear materials in it at, at that plant into the cooling things that are in the water. If that would have happened, that would have caused a massive, massive reactor failure, which would have led to the entirety of the water around there becoming irradiated. And think about a BP oil spill, except it wipes out parts of the entire eastern seaboard. What, what was their purpose for doing that? Oh, because they want they to go forthright, they're delusional. Okay. The apartment turned up no arms or materials for making bombs. Yet, a fellow member of their association suggested that the residents were more interested in online trolling than actual danger, enjoying the act of posing for photographs without a clear purpose. It was also noted that the deceased had been distancing themselves from the movement, shifting their focus to new chapters in their lives. Uh, you know, or no. fireworks for Fourth of July coming no. out. No, nothing no, like that. None of that. It's all literally there specifically to kill people. Now, is is the if anybody comes across, is there a uh, a plan, an exit strategy? Is there a this is what we're going to say? This is to make sure we're all on the same page. This is what no. we're going to do with the stuff. No, they never planned that ahead. And whatever planning that they had behind my back is kind of futile at this point. Well, why, why did you remain? Amongst these guys, now it begs the question as to why they tolerated you there. But why did you tolerate being around them? Because I was an idiot, and I was just mainly thinking along the lines of, uh, I was thinking along the lines of, oh wow, I get to stay here in this really nice apartment, in this really nice condo, while paying a rent of like 120 a month, you know, and I had internet and stuff like that, so I might as well just, you know, stay here. Okay. Just deal with like the deal with like uh, the here and there, like like bullshit. You know. Were you working? Um, I, I've been applying to a lot of places to get jobs, but... The detective guaranteed that every allegation made by Arthurs would be meticulously examined. Nonetheless, Arthurs voiced worries about his own safety and that of the detectives, suggesting a paranoid mindset. He is being charged with two instances of first-degree murder, three instances of armed kidnapping, and two instances of aggravated assault. Starting from 2020, Arthurs has been receiving treatment to restore his competency after specialists reported to the court that his mental state prevented him from comprehending legal processes sensibly. Diagnoses include schizophrenia, autism, among other conditions, and his trial remains forthcoming. In September 2010, 18-year-old Conrad Trohus was leaving school when he encountered a man wielding a handgun. The assailant demanded Conrad to hand over his bag, but when Conrad resisted, he was shot in the chest. Despite being wounded, Conrad managed to stagger away and call for help, but tragically succumbed to his injuries on the spot. The suspect, later identified as Octavian Wilcox, fled the scene, but was eventually apprehended and brought in for attempted murder. All right, here's the deal. You know something else happened. I don't sit here and talk to you without knowing what the deal is, all right? We've been talking to people. We've been interviewing people. We've been showing people pictures. We've been looking at video. I didn't bring you up here because you weren't wearing your seatbelt, okay? You got arrested for a burglary before and they didn't even bring you up here. Obviously, it's something a little more serious. As Wilcox attempts to maintain composure and feign ignorance about the situation, unbeknownst to him, his getaway driver has already been apprehended and spilled the details of their crime. This is going to go one of two ways. You're either going to be a guy who made a mistake, hanging around the wrong place the wrong time, did something dumb, or you're going to be a guy that goes out and likes to shoot people for fun. Okay? I th- listen, and do, before you say anything, I think you're a guy that made a mistake. I know you were there. Okay? I know what happened. I've talked to the victim. The victims picked you out of a photo lineup and said, that's the guy that shot me. Okay? Here's the deal. I don't think you shot that guy because you're a bad person. You didn't mean to kill that guy. 
okay? What happened was, is you were just trying to snatch his backpack, he started fighting with you, and you got scared. So, y'all saying I shot somebody? I know you shot somebody. The detective now faces the challenge of extracting a confession from Wilcox as well. As the police officer confidently stated that they had a clear understanding of what transpired, Wilcox began to show signs of being unsettled. Slumping over in his chair, he conveyed a sense of attentiveness to the cop's words. When given the opportunity to respond, his answers sounded confused and bewildered. Sensing that he has Wilcox on the back foot, the cop recognizes the need to solidify their position and bring the interrogation to a decisive conclusion. Wilcox, overwhelmed with emotion, begins to cry and expresses his fear of returning to jail. Seizing this moment of vulnerability, the detective leverages it to intensify the pressure. You're 18, right? You're 18, yes? Yeah. This is where you need to stand up and be a man and admit you made a mistake. I know you weren't trying to kill that guy. I know that because you're not the kind of guy that does that. You panicked, you got scared, you got in over your head. The victim's making you out to be a stone cold, just straight up thug killer. Guy that doesn't give a about anybody else, all right? I could stay in bed if, see, man. If, if you keep going down the path you're going down telling me you didn't have anything to do with it, it's not you, it's not you, who are people going to believe? Are they going to believe you or are they going to believe the victim? They're going to have to believe the victim because you didn't give me your side of the story. A guy that sits there like you is not a guy that goes around and kills people. You understand what I'm saying? You have remorse. You're sorry. I can see it on you. You just need to take that next step. What happened in that parking lot? Did you guys plan it? Or did it just happen? I can't, I can't, what'd you say? Don't, here, remember how we talked about that? Don't think about that. That's the least of your concerns right now. The detective tells Wilcox that he has one final chance to be honest and portray himself as someone different from the perceived monster. And in a swift turn of events, Ed Tavian Wilcox admitted to shooting Conrad Trojas, leading to his life sentence, all triggered by a dispute over a school bag. Do you say, stop hitting me or I'm going to shoot you? Anything like that? I was like, I had my hand like right here. No, you had your left hand like up against him? Yeah. Trying to push him away? I was trying to make him stop hitting me. Where was the gun? In my pocket. Which pocket? This one. How many times did you shoot? What happened after you pulled the trigger? Did he fall down or no. was he, he was still standing up? Where'd you hit him? I didn't even know I hit him. Okay. So you fired that one round. What happened? It froze up. In 1993, Jean Ann Childs resided in Horns Tower in South Minneapolis. Her life was tragically cut short when she was found stabbed to death. The crime scene was chaotic, with a messy apartment bearing bloody footprints, DNA samples, and even semen on a bloody comforter. The killer's DNA was widespread on towels, washcloths, t-shirts, and more. However, the lack of hits in the 1993 database left the case cold for 26 years. In a remarkable turn of events in 2019, investigators found a breakthrough on a genealogy website. The DNA led them to the Westrom family eventually narrowing it down to businessman Jerry Westrom. Since it was a genealogy match and not a direct DNA match, the investigators needed his DNA sample for confirmation. They discreetly followed Westrom to a hockey game, where he used a napkin that ended up in the trash. This single napkin provided the link between him and the stabbing, connecting him to the chaotic scene inside the bloody apartment. In 2019, Westrom was brought in for interrogation reopening a chapter from 26 years ago to seek answers about the crime. Let me ask you this. In 1993, okay, okay. Um, were you, did you ever date anyone in Minneapolis? No. Okay. Did you ever, and, and I'm sorry, I have to ask you this question, okay? I'm not trying to embarrass you. Did you ever have sex with a female in Minneapolis in 93 that you remember? Not that I recall. Okay. Um... Okay. Does this lady look familiar to you at all? Mm -hmm. Okay, her name is Jeannie Childs. Okay. And she was also known as Jennifer. And so she is a um a person that lived in these buildings in nineteen ninety three. Okay. And she was found in her building in her apartment deceased. Do you know anything about that at all? No. Okay, do you, do you think you would have ever had sex with her? 
I doubt it. No. Okay. I mean, in, in 93, did you, um, and I'm not trying to embarrass you, but did you visit prostitutes at all? Not as far as, um, that's here I met my wife. Okay. I'm not, I don't, uh, I'm in, besides your no. wife, in 93, would you have been with a prostitute? No, no. Okay, would you have sex with another woman in 1993 other than your wife? Yes. Okay. Um, do you, without, I'm not asking their names, but do you remember the people that you had sex with in 1993? Um, no. I mean, not that mad, no. Okay. But did any of the women live in Minneapolis? Uh, no. Okay. Right from the start, Jerry began weaving a web of lies, responding to every question from the detectives with a simple no. Clearly, he was savvy enough to understand his rights, knowing that anything he uttered could be used against him. The detectives then present all the evidence they've gathered, laying it out in front of Jerry, and all he has to offer in response is a repeated no. 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 Okay. Does it shock you to know your DNA is there? Yes. Okay. After consistently denying everything in the interrogation, the session concluded and the arrest began. Because this is, so what happened with this case, Jerry, this lady was, was killed. And these are the things that everyone looked at. And then, you know, we started looking at this case three, four years ago. And just kind of processed it and, and did whatever. And... Your DNA is at every one of these locations that we talked about just seconds, a second ago. And I was kind of wondering, you know, do you, do, do you have any idea why that would be? No. Okay. Uh, here's what I need you to, to understand is a lot of times people come down here, okay? I mean, by the time that we work on cases, it has always been many years. And it is hard for people to get over the hurdle of kind of explaining things away. It's real important that if you remember anything here, to share that with us, because we want to make sure that if something happened in this apartment that you need us to know, that we know, okay? Because there's got to be an explanation why scientifically you're there, okay? It can't be a coincidence. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of times things have happened where people say, hey, all of a sudden something happened, or there's here, let me tell you what you don't know. In Westrom's trial, a box of evidence was presented in court, with the most significant and crucial piece being the napkin. Prosecutors unveiled the chilling details, asserting that Westrom had brutally stabbed her 65 times, chased her around the apartment as she bled, and violated her. In 2012, Jerry Westrom was convicted of first-degree premeditated murder and second-degree intentional murder, earning a life sentence in prison. Dee Dee persisted in lying during her interrogation, maintaining an act of innocence throughout. Her continuous deceit proved maddening for the detectives, testing their patience to the limits. As investigators sought to unravel the truth, each fabricated tale from Dee Dee introduced a new layer of complexity and frustration to the already challenging case. Then you lived Especially in that after that man's life. decomposed corpse was dug up from your backyard. That's sick. Yeah, it was sick. Do you that think we sick. enjoyed that? No. Do you that's think sick. we enjoyed digging and and pulling even, sand even from his body? Why? You put him down there. I did not put him there. I did not. You had the whole thing. I did not. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. I, I'm, I should say a hole. I should say a rectangular shaft for perfect placement. Of a six no foot five human that. corpse. Not even no one deserves that. Why'd you put him that down that there? Piece of, that's treating that person like a piece of garbage. No one. And that's exactly that. what Why'd she you did. Why'd you I pour concrete over it? A week later. I had already planned on pouring concrete there for a while. Oh, you could have poured it anywhere else. The boy had to be right there over top where no. that body was, didn't it? No. Didn't I didn't it? it? Didn't it? Our, in, well, we can't let a damn rotting corpse into our plans to to pour that concrete. Yeah. Well, put yeah. some, you know, put the boat out there. Maybe put a big, like uh, a roof, roof over it. Yeah. Dig a fucking hole, bitch. Dig a fucking hole. Hey, oh, James. Uh, why don't you put it here? Cause I'm gonna pour concrete here yeah. anyway. I've already planned the concrete. Yeah. We'll just make the most out of it. Put the dead corpse underneath it or something. You know. 
Arkham, you could have at least RPG like ch- you know while the, while it was settling, you could have like put R.I.P. or yeah, put like a date like or something. Like a head 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 R.I.P. Yeah, you know, you know, well, you were responsible for it. No, I'm not responsible for it. Yes, you were. For it. You think because of the money I'm responsible for it, but I'm not. That man gave me that stuff that he gave me. I think you're responsible because he's buried under the slab at your house. I think he's responsible because it was your gun. I think you're, you're responsible because you ended up with every damn thing you had. I think you're responsible. And you moved into his house in Lakeland. Yeah, like you were so did. distraught. You moved into his house in Lakeland that you never paid for. Well, he won't be using this anymore. Let me just go ahead and move into it. He's not going to need it. Screw it. Let's go. Back up. You sold, within a couple weeks, you sold his cars. Oh, hey, he's not going to be using that car anymore. Mm. Sure, you like that truck? What the hell? He I won't need it. I am not Really? I am not. Really? You didn't want, tell me your you tell that. me your thinking, okay? You think that. Abraham was buried on your property April seventh. After he got killed April sixth. April twelfth or thirteenth. What? April twelfth or thirteenth. Oh, Jesus, I'm scared to death. Oh God. Steve Ray, will you take this black one? I'll take that truck over there. <laughs> Corvette. Yeah. Is that something that's scary? Is that a scary thing? Out of fear, you purchased a brand new truck for your boyfriend. <laughs> I mean, that's your story, right? <laughs> I can't believe that. That's like, that's great. <laughs> your Honor, I was scared to death, so I... That $50,000 truck? <laughs> yeah, quite a bit. That car had to be gone because I didn't... It was in my company name. It's uh-huh. under Abraham Shakespeare yeah. LLC. Yeah, uh-huh. So... So it had to be gone. Yeah. Abraham wasn't going to drive it anymore. Yeah. I, maybe it had to be gone because it helped along with the story that he was gone. <laughs> he was missing on his own. Is that right? Yeah. That helps, that <laughs> helps some this down. Sure. Yeah. This whole thing points to one thing. Greed. First degree murder. It's not greed. Dee Dee Moore. Not first degree murder. No. You can't get me for first degree. Oh yeah, I can. Oh, and oh, yes, we yes. will. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and you're gonna you're gonna get a jury to convict me for first degree murder oh, on something yeah. I haven't done. Dee Dee, I just pointed out a lot of things. How I do you think that jury cover up because y'all kept? Oh please, please, Dee Dee. I'm I getting swear. charged with something I didn't even do. Dee Dee, please, when it comes time, get up on the stand and tell all your stories because they yeah. they will eat that shit up. People will tell the you recordings, the everything, the, the the individual, Greg, that you sat there and pointed out where the freaking body is on your property. Once all this is laid out before a jury, you know what they're going to be doing? Their heads are going to be spinning from so much evidence that is pointed at you. And I knew that they're gonna it's going to point at me. I knew that it's going to point at me. Are That's why kidding? I had to do the cover-up because I knew it was going to point at me and it's not <laughs> fair because I didn't do it. Dee Dee, a master manipulator, insinuated herself into Shakespeare's life with promises of penning his rags-to-riches story. Seizing control of his finances as debts loomed, she consolidated power over his affairs. Video recordings provided by Greg served as crucial evidence before the judge. Leveraging the invaluable information Greg supplied, the police embarked on a methodical investigation guided by his insights, ultimately leading them to the exact burial site. There, they made the grim discovery of Abraham Shakespeare's remains concealed beneath a thick layer of concrete. On December 10th, 2012, Dee Dee was convicted of first-degree murder for Shakespeare's killing. She received a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole, along with an additional minimum sentence of 25 years for possessing a gun during a violent felony. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can stay updated with our latest videos.